we're ready to go. Hello, everybody. My name is Gloria Edwards, and I am the director of the of Southern Rockies Fire Science Network. And I would like to welcome, uh, we currently have 66 attendees for management responses to mountain pine beetle infestations on national forest land in the Western US, a cooperative research venture between Dr. Emily Jane Davis, Dr. Heidi Huber-Stearns, and Dr. Jesse Abrams. Their affiliations are on the screen. Um, I am hoping that all technology for this webinar is falling into place. I have the chat window open, so uh, you are welcome to post chat if anybody has any questions um, on during the webinar. And if you have questions about the content of the webinar, please post them to the question box. Uh, this webinar you'll find very interesting. They've done a lot of fascinating work throughout the Western United States. Uh, and it's brought to you by uh, the Northern Fire Science Network, the University of Georgia Ecosystem Workforce Program, University of Oregon, Oregon State, and the Southern Rockies Fire Science Network is helping to bring you the webinar. A brief word about uh, Southern Rockies Fire Science Network and your fire science networks are all part of a, a national joint fire science network that is congressionally, that is uh, funded by a congressional appropriation with the headquarters, the program headquarters in Boise, Idaho. Uh, and we are networks nationwide loosely based on general fire ecosomes. And our purpose is to provide facilitation and act as a catalyst for the communication between fire scientists, researchers, and communities to address communication and issues about um, critical fire science needs and knowledge throughout our regions. Um, if for more information, please go to southernrockiesfirescience.org. A couple of housekeeping details. Will this webinar, webinar be recorded? It is being recorded as I speak. Uh, and we should have the recording back within the day or at least within a couple of days and we will be posting it by the end of the week to um, the southern rockies fire science network youtube channel and it will also be shared by the northern rockies fire science youtube channel and again if you have questions please post questions in the uh, your control panel um, questions will be answered after all presentations um, if you have technical technical issues, you can email me at gloria.edwards at colostate.edu. I will keep my email open. And it's crucial that we have you participate in our seven question poll at the end. I think there's seven, there might be more. <laughs> I just tossed them in this morning. Um, because we're all grant funded and we your feedback is essential for the continuation of our programs. On that note, I will change presenter to Dr. Jesse Abrams, who will be managing the webinar presentation. Uh, your first presenter will be Dr. Emily Jane Davis, followed by Heidi Huberstearns, and then Jesse will be wrapping it up and we should have time for questions. And I will also stop sharing my webcam. Great. Thank you, Gloria. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Emily Jane Davis with the Ecosystem Workforce Program at Oregon State University. Um, before we get started on the content of the webinar, I just briefly wanted to explain our research organization in the context in which we did this work. Um, the Ecosystem Workforce Program is an applied social science program originally housed at Oregon State or at the University of Oregon, um, founded in the 1990s and really focused on doing very applied work that's at the intersection of social, economic, and ecological natural resource management issues, um, particularly with a dedication to producing results and working with communities in a way that can inform policy and management decisions. Next slide. And so today we're talking about um, you know, governance responses, manager responses to mountain pine beetle in the context of um, increased outbreaks of this naturally occurring insect in forests across the West. Um, many of you likely are already aware that mountain pine beetle is a naturally occurring insect in many different pine forest types, particularly lodgepole pine. Uh, 
Um, so it's a part, it's a longstanding part of those ecosystems. Um, however, there have been increases in the ex, you know, spatial extent and intensity of mountain pine beetle outbreaks across the West, starting roughly in 2000, as this graph shows. Um, and some of those impacts can be quite severe in, in localized areas, depending on the extent, the proximity to communities, um, and other values that are affected. A lot of the values that are affected by mountain pine beetle as it does cause trees to die um, and turn red and then gray and include visual and aesthetic impacts to forests, particularly adjacent to recreation areas, safety concerns when um, mountain pine beetle is occurring adjacent to roads, campgrounds, and other areas that are frequently used by the public, and also effects on where there is still a viable timber industry, um, the, that, that timber industry. There's also some longstanding concerns about the potential relationships between mountain pine beetle outbreaks and wildfires and extensive public perception in some cases that there is a relationship between mountain pine beetle killed trees and increased uh, severity of wildfire and crown fire when that occurs. Um, clearly, however, mountain pine beetle, even if there is not full scientific evidence about that, it's a forest health issue and it coexists in forests with wildfire. Um, there's a need to understand mountain pine beetle as a what we might call a coupled human natural systems issue. So it's part of a complex forest disturbance process, as I was just noting, that has multiple variables and drivers. The effects that climate change may be having on the increased intensity and frequency of mountain pine beetle outbreaks and their duration, how that might also be affecting the state of vegetation and fuel loads in the forest, all of those interacting. And that's just what's going on within the biophysical system. Um, there's also interaction with the forest governance system over there on the left-hand side of your screen. Um, can, changes in forest disturbance regimes may lead to changes in how forests are governed, which then may feed back in turn into forest conditions as well. And we also are trying to recognize the scales that that might be occurring at, particularly on the governance side, where you have forests man forest management drivers acting at different scales. Next slide. So this uh, study, or the work we're presenting today is from a larger study, that's the title of the study, and it's a coupled human natural systems study funded by the National Science Foundation. So we thank them for their support. This larger project was exploring that full set of coupled human and natural systems dynamics regarding how mountain pine beetle um, affects forests and how forest governance may change. I'd like to acknowledge our project colleagues who are from the University of Oregon, University of Georgia and University of Victoria and from the Forest Service. So today we're just going to be focusing primarily on this side of the project. We're going to be talking about how governance, forest governance changed in response to the mountain pine beetle outbreak in, the, in several different areas across the West. Um, there is a lot to talk about with um, silvicultural prescriptions or other ways that managers were dealing with mountain pine beetle in a biophysical sense. This is largely about how those governance systems changed and tried to respond to the outbreak. These are the questions we'll be addressing today, and this is a bit of a roadmap for our webinar. We were curious to understand, particularly in the context of federal land management in the West, given that um, the Forest Service owns and manages a large proportion of the forest land in the West. Did mountain pine beetle outbreaks change the playing field for how national forests are managed? There's an existing framework for how they're managed, what, what changed. Um, in order to accomplish mountain pine beetle responses, how did national forests build relationships, social consent, partnerships, and what were the barriers to doing that, to implementing that work? How did the economic options or the economic context of affected areas influence the response to mountain pine beetle outbreaks? And then finally, how did national forests leverage resources because they're attempting to deal with an unprecedented disturbance above and beyond normal levels? Next. We accomplished this through a case study approach. Um, those of you who are social scientists know well that case studies are an advantageous method for understanding a phenomenon very in depth and in its context allowing you to triangulate from multiple perspectives within one place and really deeply understand how something is happening in a place. So we conducted these case studies in several different locations. 
across the West. First in Northern Colorado, the Black Hills of South Dakota and Wyoming across the border there. Northeastern Washington and in Southwestern Montana. Um, these case studies were proposably chosen as areas that had active mount pine beetle outbreaks occurring across at least one national forest and adjacent land ownerships, and where there was some attempt to respond to the mountain pine beetle outbreaks. However, as you can see from the cases we've selected, they also did vary in terms of the spatial extent of the mountain pine beetle outbreak, the species and types of forest affected by it, um, the number of national forests involved, and then the social and economic contexts of those surrounding communities. And just another word about our methods. Um, first, we used content and document analysis, so gathering any and all documentation related to how mountain pine beetle was being managed and responded to in each area. And we use that to inform the case study interview design, so doing our homework in a sense. Then we conducted interviews with key informants in each case study area. These are those folks that are very closely involved in the mountain pine beetle management response. So that would include agency managers um, from federal and state government agencies, um, county governments, forest industry, conservation organizations, tribes, and really anyone in the affected areas that was involved in that. Um, what these interviews were you know, audio recorded, transcribed, and coded using in vivo qualitative analysis software to identify key themes about mountain pine beetle response. Now I'll pass it over to Heidi to start sharing some of our findings. Thank you. Thanks, Emily Jane. So to start, we're going to talk a bit about this first question that we asked about, did the outbreak change the playing field for you know, how different forest management decisions were made or implemented? And to start, we did um, part of what Emily Jane talked about, content analysis. So we did an analysis of legislation around uh, bills that were introduced into the Senate or House that referenced mountain pine beetle in some way. Next slide, please. And what we saw was uh, we were looking for legislation that contained something related to pine beetle. Uh, this wouldn't have picked up things like the 2014 Farm Bill because that talks about insect and disease broadly, but didn't specifically talk about the pine beetle. And so what we saw is what you can see on this chart here, the number of bills that were signed into law. You can see there are five of those in the darkest color. And then the ones that were passed by one house, which were just two, and the rest of them were introduced but not passed by either house. And we're looking over a pretty long time frame from the early 1900s on the far left until uh, more current times, 2015 to 2016. And so what we saw at the national level overall is we saw pretty minor changes in national level policy. And what we saw in kind of the progression of how pine beetle legislation was introduced is that, uh, you know, there were different kinds of framings that were used as far as, you know, if it was risk or wildfire response or things like that, which we'll talk about in just a minute. And then, you know, of the five bills that were actually passed, sorry, Jesse, <laughs> making you guess where I'm going. Of the five bills that were actually passed, three became budget appropriations bills and two were standalone legislation. So, sorry, next slide. And so then what you can see is how this framing was talked about. We really saw this kind of, you know, starting out talking about emergency responses or, you know, beetles leading to fire was really how the framing was in some of the earlier bills that were introduced. And then in more recent years, there was more language around beetles as an epidemic, beetles as an imminent threat. Um, and you still saw that kind of beetles leading to wildfire risk increases. And uh, several of these bills had framing around that, this idea of, um, of mountain pine beetle affected areas increasing wildfire risk. So whether the science was there or not for that Connection, that was a lot of what we saw in the bills. Uh, one of the most notable things that came out of this was the Healthy Forest Restoration Act uh, and the Forest Pest Control Act of 1947. So those are two of the big bills that we saw happening here. Next slide, please. And then this last slide about this kind of national level, level legislative change is uh, the point of this table is really just to show that um, the policy approaches that we analyzed, as you might expect, saw different Kind of different approaches between Democrat and Republican. So Republican bills proposed cutting back on regulatory scope, such as NEPA, while uh, Democrat-led bills led to things like proposing to spend more money to address the issue. 
And so that's what this last table shows. And really at the national level, we wouldn't expect to see kind of massive change, but this was one of the first levels that we started at to understand, you know, was there some kind of legislative response to things like pine beetle that are fairly fast moving, you know, hitting widespread swaths of land and that have actually occurred uh, before in past history. So then we went to the uh, kind of the local to state level change next. And at that level, what we saw, you know, through our interviews and the document analysis that we did is we saw a lot of capacity building efforts taking place across scale. This is everything from uh, new sources of federal funding, a reallocation of existing funds, reallocation of existing funds within a region to go to forests that have been hit hardest uh, by high people. We also saw uh, new state funding, more forest health or federal forest health projects being funded and uh, other things that so we saw even county and NGO level groups, private funds, uh, particularly in South Dakota, really trying to bring some money to the table to address the, uh, in many cases, to address the, the post pine beetle impacts. So, the, you know, the dead and dying trees after the fact. In some cases, um, there were some more preventative measures taken, which we'll talk about a little bit more. And so then as far as common responses that we saw, uh, we saw the increased adoption of existing policy tools. So that's things like the use of stewardship contracting or the use of good neighbor authority to address some of the areas either hit hardest by pine beetle or at higher risk. Uh, we saw uh, increased state and federal coordination. So working across land ownerships to try to figure out how to address some of the highest risk areas. And then we also saw some attempts to increase the efficiency of the NEPA process. So larger analysis areas, shorter timelines for getting projects out the door. And then, uh, you know, we saw also that there were place-specific innovations that were supposed to really address, you know, kind of locally-based issues, so solving operational or policy problems. Uh, another existing approach that we saw was the use, and this was widespread across our cases, the use of categorical exclusions for things such as uh, this photo on the right, which is clearing power lines or other areas that were of highest risk uh, to wildfire or other kinds of uh, impacts post pine beetle and trying to keep some of those areas clear. Next slide, please. And so then one of the other factors that uh, we kind of synthesized some of the factors that we saw for this local and regional response, what led to the ability to respond at the local level or at kind of a, a regional level, so a multi-forest level. And one of the important factors that we saw was uh, social consent. And we saw a lot of social consent built through networks uh, in response to pine beetle in all of our cases. Uh, to a much lesser degree, this happened in Montana. In the other cases, there was quite a bit of social consent built through new forums that we'll talk about, uh, as well as some existing forums to try to figure out how to address the impacts of pine beetle, both from a recreation perspective, as well as from a uh, health and safety perspective of falling trees, as well as uh, kind of a processing ability to get wood to market perspective, so from a variety of perspectives. Uh, and we also saw different responses to harvesting and processing of the structure. So, you know, places that had existing facilities in place that could take pine beetle killed wood or that could ramp up their work to get more wood out of the forest were able to address more acres uh, than places that didn't have existing markets in place. This also depended on the quality of wood. Um, in some cases, the quality of the pine beetle killed wood was not actually able to be processed. And so we saw kind of the highest amount of processing in Washington and South Dakota cases, and then the lowest ability to uh, process some of that wood in Montana uh, and Colorado. And then again, this idea of the value and accessibility of the timber in Montana and Colorado, uh, in a lot of cases in Montana, by the time sales went through the, uh, the wood that was included in the sale that had uh, pine, pine beetle kill was actually not in viable shape to, to take out of the woods and get any kind of economic uh, return from. And so it was kind of a quality of the wood as well as the species of the wood not being uh, appropriate for processing. And then at the same time in Colorado, the lack of facilities, uh, existing infrastructure that was in place to deal with processing that type of wood uh, made it difficult to get timber to market with some kind of, um, some kind of positive cost benefit analysis. And then there also was this other key factor of national level support or what we called kind of the idea of friends in high places. So some of the forests that were more connected to the Washington level or to Congress or to other places actually were able to get more of a political response, which often manifested in uh, dollars being reallocated or redirected to their areas to help them deal with pine beetle concerns. Next slide, please. So then the second question of how forest built 
uh, some of the social consent and partnerships and what some of the barriers might have been. The you know, first really key thing that we saw, next slide please, were the existing and new forums. So we saw existing networks such as the Northeast Washington Forestry Coalition, which is this NEWFC, uh, as well as other existing working groups were a kind of a venue for people to get together and talk about this, this most recent forest health issue. So some of the working groups in Montana talked about you know, forest management overall, and so this was kind of part of their portfolio of now what do we do with pine beetle response. Um, and then, for example, the uh, Northwest Colorado uh, Council, of, uh, Council of Governments actually helped form the Colorado, Colorado Bark Beetle Association Coalition that we see down here as a new forum in 2005. So in some cases, these existing forums actually helped create new forums. And so two examples of these new groups that were created were the CBBC in 2005 and then the Black Hills Regional Mountain Pine Beetle Working Group, which has an incredibly long acronym in about 2010, which came out of a, a group that had advised on Black Hills management before that. So in some cases, we actually saw places that uh, local folks, uh, NGOs, environmental organizations, timber industry representatives, state and federal agencies and others were actually getting together in these coalitions, a lot of county involvement, to really understand how and where they could respond. And so a lot of that uh, was where we saw some of that social capital and social consent being built, as well as some of the cross-boundary work coming together. Next slide, please. And so these existing and new forums allowed, like I said, some of this cross-boundary work, as well as creating opportunities for folks to articulate some of the concerns they had around mountain pine beetle, to plan different treatments on national forest land and in some cases on adjoining lands when it was possible. And then to develop some of this cross-boundary coordination and communication, uh, things that we've seen actually last beyond really the hardest part of uh, the pine beetle response. And you know, some of those connections are people still working together. In some cases, like in Colorado, a lot of their work has turned into broader kind of forest resiliency, forest health response. Uh, but those same actors are at the table thinking about forest management, especially on federal lands. And then we also saw that the existing and new forums created an opportunity for dialogue and collaborative planning. So out of the, you know, the trust that had been built in these working relationships, it might have allowed, in some cases, we saw that it allowed for more aggressive or innovative approaches within the forest uh, than maybe would have been possible before some of this trust was built. Uh, in other cases, like I said, it helped kind of propel this conversation forward about you know, forest, kind of forest health more broadly. Next slide, please. And then just as a you know a last kind of wrap up on some of the barriers to the partnerships that we saw, in in all the cases in all four places we saw that the conflicts that came up were really over familiar issues. So these were over you know really deeply embedded, entrenched issues about federal forest management that were in place long before pine, this most recent round of pine beetle hit their forests. And so that's things like uh, issues in litigation over roadless or wilderness areas. Uh, over endangered species, which in particular was an issue in Region 1 in Montana. Uh, also, you know, kind of the, some of the deeply entrenched conflicts, litigation, or, or other kind of perspectives on federal forest management stayed the same through this time period. And so that meant that even if groups were formed or responses to pine beetle were created, those familiar issues were still at the table and still really shaped the response that was actually possible for some forests. And then for capacity for response, you know, again, this idea of the ability of a forest or a place to respond to pine beetle really was dictated, dictated by many of their pre-existing conditions. So um, kind of their latent capacity for agency staff to take on new or bigger planning efforts on a faster timeline, uh, the feasibility of wood processing, if it was economically viable, if the wood products were the right ones and the right size diameter, all of that as well as things like you know, funding for staff to do this work or the ability to bring in an ID team or get regional money to help uh, deal with communication or planning or other parts of pine beetle response. And then also just this idea of responsiveness, you know, the, the ability of, uh, of folks to actually respond on a time frame that moved as fast as or got ahead of the pine beetle was fairly limited. And a lot of that really had to do with these other parts of their existing capacity for federal land management. And so I think at this point, we can go to the next slide and transition it over to Jesse. Okay, thank you, Heidi. So uh, what I'm gonna be talking about here is this, this question that Heidi, Heidi already touched on to some extent, and that's this notion of the economic uh, dimension 
well, sort of at the local to regional level, influencing the mountain pine beetle response. Uh, and so clearly one of the most uh, sort of obvious uh, kind of components of this would be the, the, the extent to which there was a local uh, timber industry or some kind of local options for, for processing material com coming off of the forest. Uh, and so there are a few different variables that were, that were important here. Uh, one is that obviously, as I said, the, uh, the types of uh, local processing capacity combined with things like the quality of the wood and uh, the accessibility of the wood and so, uh, in other words, in some cases, particularly in Colorado and in Montana, uh, you had a lot of beetle killed forest in places that were either um, roadless or in steep sort of uh, places that were expensive to get to. And so in those cases, um, it, it raised the, the, um, the overall cost of treatment. You know, Colorado was an interesting case in the sense that of the, of the four case studies, it was the place that had the, the least pre-existing capacity, uh, tim uh, sort of timber processing capacity. And so uh, at least part of the effort, that the response effort in Colorado was essentially around trying to rebuild that industry and create some local options for adding value to, to beetle killed trees. Uh, and, and sort of for, for various reasons, it was a tough, it was a very tough um, situation for making that successful. And that had to do with the fact that the, the beetle hit Colorado um, right around the time of the Great Recession, and so they were trying to essentially invest in wood processing uh, infrastructure at the same time that the wood products markets were collapsing. Then there were some other issues around, um, you know, there was a fire at one facility in Kremlin. Uh, there was a, a biomass plant in Gypsum that was supported by some of this work that was sort of constantly in and out of lawsuits at, with various levels with the local community, with the federal government. Uh, and so it was sort of a, in that case, sort of a perfect storm that made it very difficult to um, to really establish a processing infrastructure, and therefore it made it quite expensive to do treatments. And so in, in Colorado, they ended up uh, spending quite a bit of money per acre. Uh, another variable that was important here was kind of the scale and timing of the outbreak. Um, you know, in Colorado, again, uh, you essentially had large landscapes getting hit uh, all at once, and so it kind of created this this glut of of beetle killed trees at the same time. As I said, that there were uh, uh, sort of very weak markets and few processing uh, options. And so, in, as I said, sort of Colorado is a perfect storm of bad conditions. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, you have places like um, the Colville in Northeast Washington and the Black Hills National Forest that had. A, a very sort of robust local timber industry that allowed them to move fairly quickly and get ahead of the of the outbreak to some extent. Um, and so uh, this uh, allowed them to move quickly and it also gave them options in terms of whether they were treating sort of uh, already hit uh, stands or whether they were looking at treating green stands. And so on the Black Hills uh, National Forest, uh, for example, the focus was really on green sales versus in a place like Colorado, the focus was on um, was on salvage. And again, that has to do with both the, the existing infrastructure, but also the timing and sort of the, the scale of the outbreak. Um, so interestingly, Mon the Montana case um, is an example of a place where there was existing uh, infrastructure, timber industry infrastructure, but what they were mostly lacking, at least in some geographies there, was the social consent to move forward. And so I think when we look at places like the Colville and Black Hills that were able to move pretty aggressively, um, it wasn't simply that they had the infrastructure, it's that they'd also spent a lot of time building that social consent that allowed them to move quickly uh, once, uh, once the time was right to start treating. And so again, some of those challenges that I talked about um, in Colorado, the focus was really on salvage. There was an attempt to rebuild that timber industry infrastructure which was very difficult to do, especially on, on a short timeline and, and at a moment of, of sort of collapsing uh, markets for wood products. Uh, in Montana, there, there was, uh, again, it was, Montana was sort of a complex case because you had sort of different, um, different outcomes depending on exactly where you were on these forests. There were some places where that consent was built. They were able to um, get a, a collaborative forest rest, landscape restoration project going in other places. As Heidi mentioned, there were these sort of um, kind of ongoing long-term issues over things like endangered species, roadless areas, et cetera. <clears throat> and unlike in some of our other cases, 
uh, had a harder time breaking out of that kind of adversarial cycle, and that made it more difficult to move quickly to uh, to do any sort of treatment as a response. So the, the sort of the last substantive piece we want to talk about here is this question of how forests leverage resources. And so again, this gets to the question of uh, these are sort of large outbreaks uh, happening at a time when most of these forests have been uh, declining in their capacity for various reasons. Part of that has to do with having to spend more money on wildfires. Part of that has to do with um, sort of the declining uh, timber harvest. That means less uh, sort of funding related to timber. And then part of it has to do with those just sort of basic um, congressional appropriations. So as, as Heidi mentioned, uh, each of our cases uh, showed the use of some of these new tools and new authorities. And so you can see the list here um, of some of these newer tools, the Good Neighbor Authority, uh, stewardship contracting, the Joint Chiefs Landscape Restoration Program, the Collaborative Forest Landscape Restoration Program, the 2014 Insect and Disease uh, Categorical Exclusion that came out of the, the 2014 Farm Bill, and then Tribal Forest Health Protection Act projects. And so what, what you can see here is there's at least some of these adopted by each of these forests, but, um, but sort of uh, there's some interesting patterns here, which is to say, for example, that in Washington on the Colville National Forest, this is a forest that um, sort of had been known even pre-mountain uh, pine beetle outbreak as being very innovative, uh, sort of early adopter of a lot of these sorts of policies. And so it's no surprise to see that they were also employing them uh, in response to the mountain pine beetle. Um, on the other hand, you have a, a forest like Colorado, which, which didn't use some of these newer um, authorities, but was still able to, to get a decent amount done using things like stewardship contracting, good neighbor authority, and as Heidi mentioned, uh, sort of an infusion of cash from the national level. Uh, if we compare the, the Black Hills case with Montana, I think we see an interesting pattern, which is that uh, the Black Hills case, even though they uh, moved very quickly and, and got a lot of um, sort of treatments done, and ended up using fewer of these sort of new tools than did Montana, which, as I mentioned, had a harder time, at least in some geographies, uh, moving forward with these treatments. And I think, again, to me, this points to the idea that that all of these tools uh, sort of build on social consent, but they can't necessarily replace social consent. And so in the Black Hills, uh, for example, one of the most um, sort of important sort of uh, bureaucratic steps that was taken was to do a very large EIS that covered essentially the entire forest that, that then allowed them to move quickly to treat individual stands uh, as the need arose. And, and that actually didn't use any of these um, innovative policy tools. That was just you kind of done under your standard NEPA uh, guidelines. And so I think the, the point there again is that when you have that social consent, you have the flexibility to be more creative. Uh, and then when that social consent is lacking, it even with all these tools, it can be uh, quite difficult to get any work done. Uh, and so that part of that again has to do with how do we fill in for capacity, it has to do with um, how do we bring more funding to the table, more uh, capacity to plan and implement projects. And then there's these what we think of as the policy and practice innovations. And so this is kind of a, a subtle but but we think important component of what we saw in each of these cases, which is this kind of local scale, pragmatic problem solving that's meant to help overcome some of these smaller but but potentially significant barriers to getting work done. And so these, again, it sort of sounds like, a, I'm gonna sound like a broken record, but again, this was all built out of the idea of, of uh, these networks that helped to build a common vision, build that consent, and these sort of networks of both agency and non-agency folks working together. And so, um, as I mentioned, once you have that common vision, uh, it's a lot easier to, to sort of get creative with uh, this sort of problem solving at the local scale. And so what do we mean by this sort of local problem solving? This is actually a slide from a cohesive strategy report uh, uh, detailing some of the changes that were made in Colorado that can be sort of seen as uh, some of the success stories of that Colorado bark beetle coalition. I'm not gonna go through all these, but I'll just highlight a few of them. Uh, so one of them here being, uh, that there were these stumpage assessments that were that were assessed for ski areas uh, who wanted to remove some of these hazard trees. And so the idea was by kind of standard forest service procedures, they were required to pay stumpage on these trees, which made no sense to them because they uh, essentially they were low value and weren't in a, a sort of a, at a scale that would even be commercial uh, under better conditions. And so one of the things that this group did was to help to remove that requirement so that skiers could go ahead and move some of the, remove some of these trees. Uh, in other cases, there had been timber sales that had already been 
um, uh, contracted as green sales. Those areas were then hit by the mountain pine beetle and turned into salvage sales. And so the, excuse me, the buyers were on the hook for essentially paying green, green tree prices for, for dead trees. And so the CBBC was able to help facilitate uh, revaluing those contracts. And then one of the interesting things that we saw in Colorado was, um, was this, what they call the bark beetle incident command team, which essentially was used the exact same structure, this incident command structure as is used for things like wildfires and other sort of emergency incidents to essentially sequence and uh, coordinate the, the response across three different national forests. And so the idea here is that you had sort of this executive level team that was helping to make sure that the, the money was being used in the most effective and efficient manner across forests. And that included things like some, some multi-forest EISs for, um, for dealing with, th with things like infrastructure. So these are just a few examples of the kinds of innovations we're talking about. These are sort of, they're not the big level policy sorts of questions we often think about. They're more that kind of small, local level problem solving that can really make the difference between being able to move forward uh, efficiently and, and kind of getting stuck. And so here are a few other examples that we could talk about from some of the other forests. So I mentioned this, this sort of forest-wide EIS on the Black Hills. Uh, that was the Pine Beetle Response Project, also called PBR. Um, allowing, also on the Black Hills, allowing these national forest adjacent landowners to cut infested trees along their property boundaries. Uh, we saw in the Colville this sort of experimentation with third-party NEPA. So in other words, the, um, rather than having the agency do the NEPA, the, the NEPA was contracted out, but still under the supervision of the Forest Service. Uh, and then we saw these coalitions that, that really helped to bring both state and federal funding, as well as in some cases, um, other sources of funding to address these sort of cross-boundary issues of mountain pine beetle response. And so we saw these in, in all cases. As far as the states contributing funding, we saw that especially in, in, the, in South Dakota, Montana, and in Colorado. Uh, so a few more observations before we get to our conclusion. So I think one of the big take-homes here is that there was no singular sort of response pattern across our cases. Uh, and so in other words, we think about the, the U.S. Forest Service being this um, kind of a unified agency, uh, we're talking about roughly similar forest types in the sense we're mostly talking about lodgepole and ponderosa pine in these systems. And yet we really saw a lot of variability in, across our four cases. Uh, and so in some cases, for example, in, um, in Washington and Montana, we, we saw very few projects that were, that were really specific to mountain pine beetle. Instead, we saw a lot of sort of larger um, sort of landscape scale projects uh, of which, in, within which the, the mountain pine beetle was one concern that was integrated with others. Uh, on the other hand, in Colorado and, and in the Black Hills, we saw that a lot of treatments were really sort of laser focused on those mountain pine beetle issues. Um, we also saw some, some real variability in the extent to which these places were taking into account sort of the community, the larger community aspect, and this notion of kind of the social and psychological dimension of the issue. And so we talk a lot about this notion of social consent and, and sort of building social consent through these networks. And a lot of that was focused on what you might think of as the most involved uh, players, right? The, the counties, the states, the nonprofits, the environmental organizations, the timber industry, um, and yet they're the, the sort of wider community that in some cases is also uh, feels very affected by these by these changes to the forest. And so the place where we saw this come through most strongly was in the Black Hills, uh, where the community, essentially the community of Custer uh, created this, this sort of longstanding, now longstanding tradition of kind of celebrating and uh, sort of psychologically fighting back against the beetle every year through this festival that takes place in January. This is the the Burning Beetle Festival. Um, and so it, it includes a whole bunch of sort of community events, music, uh, kind of a pub crawl through town, but then also this this event where they build this this giant sort of wooden bark beetle and then uh, the community comes out and, and sort of torches the whole thing. And so it's just sort of, I think, an interesting example, but also shows that um, while we may, might sometimes get focused on sort of the, the technical and policy aspect, there's this larger community aspect as well. And I think the people in this, this landscape felt very um, affected by the, the, the change to their forest. And this was a, a sort of important way for them to feel like they were participating in some way and in recognizing that and, and doing something to, doing what they could to sort of push back. Uh, so the, one of the questions we, we started with here was, this idea, this question of whether mountain pine beetle outbreaks open a window of opportunity in some way, does it change the way that governance occurs at, at 
any scale, local, regional, or national scales. And I think our, our conclusion here is that, that yes, it potentially does, but the window is open pretty briefly and exactly what happens in that window of opportunity depends a lot on the local to regional context. Again, we didn't see a lot of, of sort of formal policy change at the national level. There are a few things we could point to, but didn't change the playing field for, for dealing with these sorts of outbreaks. So the, the big variables here, again, I, I keep repeating this, but social consent built through those networks is huge. And without that, it's sort of like all the other tools in the world uh, may not get you very far. Uh, the next piece that, again, maybe just stating the obvious here, but having that harvesting and processing infrastructure, when you have that in place and you're able to build that social consent, it gives you a lot more options, allows you to be a lot more um, sort of creative with your treatments and allows you to do things you can't do if you're paying a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars an acre to go in there and treat. Uh, the value and the accessibility of the timber, and that again has to do with things that are beyond people's control, like uh, how steep the terrain is, where the roads are, uh, how quickly the beetle move through, and uh, at what rate that, that timber is starting to decay versus the, the planning process. Um, I think if there's one sort of take home message from this is this idea of virtuous cycle. So the idea that um, when you start to build that consent and you start to build those innovations, you can start to attract funding and in doing so you can start to show success and, and kind of success builds on success. And so I think in, in the cases where we saw sort of some, some uh, successful examples of early uh, sort of network building and consent building is where we really saw the most success in dealing with these, um, with, with whatever challenges were sort of um, presented by the, the mountain pine beetle outbreak in those geographies. So for a few conclusions here, um, I think one of the important ones here is that is this first point that resilience is really a long-term project. What we what we were mostly focused on here was what are these places doing sort of in the short term uh, in the wake of a of a large mountain pine beetle outbreak. And there's a lot that these forests were doing. There, we saw a lot of innovation. We saw a lot of sort of funding getting uh, shifted around and, and lots of creativity. But I think almost everyone in these cases recognizes that the best time to to treat a forest for resiliency is not after the beetles have hit, it's a, it's a much longer term project. And I think in light of this idea that that the, the window of opportunity is short, uh, it, it kind of creates a, a potential tension there with sort of how do we uh, create this long-term resilience uh, when these, these opportunities to really make change tend to be short and fleeting. Uh, I think another conclusion here uh, is that it's very difficult to ramp up your capacity and particularly to ramp up your processing infrastructure on a short timeline. And I think Colorado shows, again, Colorado was hit with some, some bad timing and lots of other things, but it, it shows that it, it can be very difficult to sort of, uh, even with a lot of investment, to, to build enough capacity to support the kinds of treatments that uh, people often wanna see happening after these, these sorts of um, outbreaks. Uh, and the agency itself can actually struggle to add capacity on short notice. So we, we often think that, you know, if, if sort of, if the funding's there, that the agency can sort of move quickly to, to fill those positions, but that's that's often not the case, that there's a timeline there to both get people hired, but also to get them trained, to get them integrated into these projects. And so when you're trying to move quickly, that, that, can, that can be a struggle. Um, and then again, to sort of uh, repeat this final point, the, these recent policy tools do help to expedite. They really do provide some room for creativity, for thinking across boundaries, for bringing in new resources. But, um, but they're not a silver bullet. And so that planning and analysis do take time still. And, and the thing that tends to bog the planning and analysis down more than anything else is really conflict. And so in, again, in cases where uh, there was sort of a common vision built, uh, the planning and analysis went much more quickly and smoothly than in places where that conflict was, was persistent. So that's all we have for now. Uh, we wanna save lots of time for questions, uh, but we did before we uh, end this, we wanted to point out that we have a project page here on the Ecosystem Workforce Program website. You can see that here. Uh, and it includes, for example, a working paper that was recently published uh, that kind of summarizes many of the findings from our case studies. It also includes this briefing paper you see on the right-hand side, uh, which is a shorter, kind of summary of some of the key points from this research. And so I think with that, we have maybe one more uh, outro slide and then we'll have time for questions.
I think that was our last slide. And I would just add uh, that on that project page, we also have a lot of the uh, publications uh, that have come out of the project as well. So it's a good resource to see some of the other work related to this project. Okay, great. So that sounds like we don't have a, a sort of a final outro slide then. All right. In that case, I'll turn it back over to Gloria, and I think she's going to facilitate the, the question and answer session. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Okay. Uh, I'm unmuted and uh, should be sharing my screen. Just a second, let me get caught up here. Show screen. Okay, hold on. Okay. Um, can the other presenters let me know? Are, is the outro slide showing up for you? Yes, yes. we have. We can hear you, Gloria. Okay, and the thanks for attending slide is now showing? Correct. Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, we do have some questions. It was a very attentive audience. Um, and it's not letting me uh, get at a lot of the questions. So let me ask the first one um, while I'm trying to get at the earlier ones. There's a perceived relationship between pine beetle outbreaks and future wildfire risk was mentioned. Is there agreement among scientists as to whether there is a correlation at various scales? So I know that this has been debated in um, the scientific community for a while. Yeah, do you, do you want me to take that one or does someone else want to take that? I think Jesse should take it to start. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's it's a great question. Um, I, I'll, I'll Maybe I'll start by saying that none of us on this presentation are fire scientists. And so the, the, I think the best we can say is to try to represent the fire science that we're most familiar with, which is to say that it's complicated. Um, there's certainly not a, a clear... Uh, there, there's not a clear uh, linear relationship between, for example, uh, mountain pine beetle outbreaks and increased fire risk or intensity. Uh, and there's, in some cases, there there have even been evidence of decreased fire risk following um, following a, a, a mountain pine beetle outbreak. You know, I think what, and I don't want to misrepresent the fire science on this. I'll, I'll mostly defer to others who know this better than I do. But I think what they would say is. Um, it, it certainly changes, mount, these mountain pine beetle outbreaks can change the fuel um, availability and the sort of the architecture of the forest in ways that can affect fire behavior into the future. And so you get different levels of, uh, of fire risk and fire behavior in, in a green forest versus a forest in which the needles have turned red versus a forest in which the needles have fallen, but the trees are still standing versus a forest in which those trees have started to come down. And so I, I think if we're looking for a, a you know, kind of a simple relationship between an insect outbreak and increased fire risk or fire intensity, we won't find that. I think what we will find is uh, changes in fire behavior and, in, again, in sort of the fuel availability and the architecture of the forest, depending on the timing since the outbreak. So I think that's, if I go further than that, I'll probably be way out beyond my, my area of expertise in that. And so again, I'll, I think I'll mostly defer to the fire scientists on that, but that's my best uh, understanding and sort of representation of that, that relationship. And I think I would just add relevant to the fact that we're, we're social scientists is regardless of the biophysical science, there's a lot of public concern about potential wildfire impacts, which motivated some of the responses mm -hmm. and also um, some of the tools and innovations that we found being used to respond to mountain pine beetle are also those that are used to reduce fuels and reduce fire risk. Okay, um, another question. Has a toolbox, quote unquote, been developed to help address future barriers and obstacles and better respond to position ourselves for future outbreak? Very good question. This is uh, from Todd. Um, who wants to take that question? I can I can start. This is Heidi. I, I would start by just saying um, we didn't necessarily develop a toolbox, but we have 
uh, in this working paper and the briefing paper that are on our web page of briefing paper being like a two page uh, kind of high level summary, we have tried to distill down some of the key lessons that we saw and some of the, you know, like a lot of the things that Jesse and I talked about, you know, trying to really distill down some of the important ingredients that we see across pine beetle issues. And I would say that based on other research that uh, we have all done, it, it seems like a lot of those things, so you know, having that social consent and trust and having either the ability to create forums or new forum, build new forums, et cetera, all of those factors are things that we see in other responses to particularly large landscape scale changes with forests. So we see those as being important in multiple cases. And so I think we've developed a kind of a list of important ingredients, but I wouldn't say a toolbox. Jesse or Emily, Jane, I don't know if you want to add to that. Yeah, I'll, I'll maybe just, just jump in and say, um, you know, again, I think one of our take homes from this research is that each place is really unique. It has its own sort of, um, its own uh, sort of flavor, its own it sort of um, opportunities, its own challenges. And so certainly I don't think any one approach is gonna work across landscapes. I do think uh, in, in each place you go, you're starting to see people get creative with both the new tools that are out there as well as some of the sort of the older policies. And so, um, you know, so I, my, our hope is that some of our publications from this project will help maybe disseminate some of those ideas around what other places have done. Uh, but but really, people in these local landscapes have been been quite creative and um, you know using in some cases things that uh, wouldn't even be on the radar of, of people in another geography. So I, I think it's pretty diverse what what people can do at the local level. Okay, um, moving along, we have a, a lot of questions. Um, some really great discussion, and we just have a few more minutes, although we do have the webinar reserved for um, beyond noon, so I think we, we should be okay. Um, next question, as discussed, <laughs> no, come on, computer. As discussed, resilience is a long-term project. Were you able to assess if and how resilience is being incorporated into long-term planning? Question by Tom Troxell. That seems like a good one for you, Jesse, given your other project on resilience, actually. Yeah, I was just going to say, I um, yeah, I do have another research project that's specifically looking at uh, at that question, which is, you know, how is resilience being incorporated into planning, both at the level of forest plans and in the level of EISs. And so I'll, I'll have a better answer on that, um, you know, in about a year. But I would say that um, I guess what I see are kind of two countervailing forces on that question. One is, on the one hand, we're, we're seeing the concept of resilience being uh, sort of more present in planning and, and sort of the, the general policy discourse around forestry. We're starting to see, I think, more focus on this idea of thinking long term, uh, treating for resilience. Uh, we're starting to see a lot of policy tools that I think are um, can really help facilitate that. On the other hand, we're also seeing um, the agency continuing to struggle with um, with declines in capacity, declines in funding, and so uh, it's it's very tough to actually implement a, a resilience-focused um, sort of program of work without the, both the people and the funding to make that happen. Um, and so I think again, it's it's going to really vary depending on exactly where you are. I think in, in some places. Again, if all the ingredients are there and all the sort of the stars are aligned, you might be able to see, you know, an opportunity to to um, to manage for resilience over the long term. In other places, maybe where there's not the industry, where the the, the economic opportunity isn't there, where the capacity is lower, uh, it can be really tough to, to implement that kind of program of work. Um, okay, real quick, uh, we have a comment. Um, just an FYI from Rich Edwards, Colorado did have two CFLRPs, um, Community Forest Landscape Restoration Programs, awarded in 2010, Front Range and Uncompahgre National Forest Areas, and the chart didn't reflect this. So I, do you want to go back to the chart or do you want to talk, just address that real quick? Yes, so that is that is a good point. You know, so the, the Uncompahgre was outside of our um, of our study area for Colorado. So we focused on the White River, the Medbo, and the Arapaho Roosevelt in Colorado. And so the, the Arapaho Roosevelt, it's true, did have the front range CFLRP 
and, and so we, we actually do have a publication coming out that, that looks at, at the, that includes that as part of the analysis. And so, um, you know, so why didn't we include it on the chart? That, that's a good question. I think because uh, the people that we talked to didn't include that uh, in their list of mountain pine beetle specific responses, uh, but it may, maybe that that's a mistake. And so we, we'll go back and, and double check that to make sure that we're not, um, or that we're not mistaken on that point. Yeah, Jesse, okay. I believe that's right, is our list was based off of what, what people had identified uh, through the interviews, but it's definitely worth a double check because it's an important point. Okay, thanks folks. Uh, how long did it take uh, the Black Hills to complete their forest-wide EIS, environmental impact statement? Brandon Hoke, I'm sorry, Brandon, if I'm mispronouncing your name. I'll have to get back to you on that one, and there, there may be other folks who are on the um, in the webinar here that could answer that better, answer that question better than I can, including Tom Troxell, because uh, I think he was probably, uh, if not involved, at least had a, a front row seat to that. Um, but I'd certainly be happy to look into that and get back to you. Okay, uh, another question: Is there a reason why Northern Colorado interviewees were sampled approximately double everyone else in the four sample areas? 58 versus 29 sampling methods? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, sorry, we should have mentioned it on that slide. We had a, a, a research associate who worked on a specific project that was more focused on archival work. So looking at a longer history of mountain pine beetle uh, impacts in one of the places, uh, some of that work was done in Black Hills and then some of it was also done in Colorado. And so that increased the number of interviewees that we had in that area as a separate component of our research. All right, sorry about the webcams here, folks. I'm trying to uh, get the other webcams to show up. <laughs> um, all righty. All right, we've already answered the perceived relationship between pine beetle. The Black Hills encompasses the Black Elk Wilderness Area. What conflicts are common when it comes to managing mountain pine beetle issues in wilderness areas? And two, how can these conflicts be combated or prevented in a way that uh, upholds wilderness character? Jessica Millman. Great question. Uh, Heidi, do you have any thoughts on that? Do you want me to take it? Why don't you start, Jesse? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Uh, uh, and it is that is an issue that came up essentially to, to some extent in each of our cases. Uh, both wilderness and also designated roadless areas that are not um, uh, or inventoried roadless areas that are not designated as wilderness. Uh, certainly, I think we saw in some cases, including in the Black Hills, uh, some people would say that the wilderness area, because it was not available for treatment, uh, was, was seen as, as part of the source of a, of a larger outbreak. Um, I don't think that all of our interviewees would agree with that, but but certainly some of them made that argument. Um, in other cases, we saw wilderness or places that were potentially available to be designated wilderness in the future as um, you know, as a key issue. And so, boy, it's that's a tough one. Um, you know, I would say that I'll, I'll maybe answer that question best by looking at the Colorado case, which is to say. Colorado had both a lot of um, uh, some wilderness areas, but also some inventory roadless areas that in the very beginning were starting to cause some conflict in terms of, of co coming to consensus on a response. Eventually what the stakeholders uh, kind of came to realize was that with the amount of funding and capacity that they had, that they'd actually would only be able to treat a relatively small proportion of the landscape anyway. And so if they focus that on those areas that were considered the highest priority, which is primarily the front country, um, uh, power line corridors, utility corridors, uh, roads, trailheads, um, areas in the wild and urban interface, that that would essentially take up all the capacity and funding that they had. And so it kind of meant that the, the more contentious issues of roadless and wilderness were off the table. Uh, now, on the other hand, you go to Montana, you go to the Helena National Forest and the, the 10 mile watershed and, and the fact that that's a roadless area, I think figures very strongly into why there's so much conflict over some of those treatments. And, and so 
I think, again, it really depends on the, on the context, but in places where they, I think, mostly avoided dealing with that issue, things went a lot more smoothly than in places where, um, where there was some attempt to actually um, do some management in those, those roadless areas. So that's not exactly an answer to quest the question that you asked, but I, I think that comes close. Heidi, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I was just going to say really briefly, because I know we need to wrap up at the top of the hour here, but I would just add that I think that in wilderness and roadless areas, a lot of what people talked about, what, what was done was really a lot about uh, communication of hazards, falling trees on trails and things like that. So it really was a public safety hazard type of communication that was going on. Um, and the one other thing I would say is some of our interviewees might also say that you know, the inability to work in roadless or wilderness areas might have intensified or changed where other treatments were done on the lands that were able to be accessed. Um, that's what some folks would say. So those are just the two things I'd add before we wrap up here. Okay, uh, that brings us to the end of our questions. Um, as we stated, the webinar is uh, being recorded and we'll be available on the Southern Rockies Fire Science Network YouTube channel. Uh, you can access that by just going to uh, YouTube and type in Southern Rockies Fire Science Network or Northern Rockies Fire Science Network, and we should have them posted by the end of the week. Uh, thank you very much to Dr. Davis, Dr. Huber Stearns, and Dr. Abrams for the research, uh, and also to the National, Fu uh, National Science Foundation for the funding. Um, we will be also sending out messages for links to both attendees and non-attendees after the webinar. So on that note, thank you for attending, and this concludes the webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. And file.